The Life of Riley, formerly heard at this time, will be heard one hour from now over most of these NBC stations. RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television, proudly presents... Screen Directors Playhouse, star Claudette Colbert, production Tomorrow is Forever, director Irving Pitchell. The Hollywood Screen Directors present A Memory Revisited, the motion picture drama Tomorrow is Forever. Starring Claudette Colbert in her original role of Elizabeth with Jeff Chandler. November 5th, 1918, the Western Front. Elizabeth! No. No, Dr. Ludwig. Please, the letter. But, Lieutenant, you do not understand. When our German patrol picked you up on the battlefield, there was no identification on you but this letter. Give it to me. You must certainly realize that your wife will be told you are dead. You call this being alive, Doctor? My body shattered, my face, what there is left of it, a horror? There is such a thing as plastic surgery. Tell us who you are so that we can notify your wife. And for this fragment of a life, destroy her life? No. Now give me back the letter. Of course. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. It was over at last, November 11th, 1918, and the nations were dancing in the streets. The First World War was over. We all stood at the windows of the Hamilton Chemical Works, watching the marches and the revelers go by. I stood alone with my own thoughts, and then the kindly voice of Larry Hamilton, junior partner in the company, was at my elbow. Well, Mrs. MacDonald, you're taking the armistice very calmly. Calmly? Oh, I'm so excited, I, I can hardly breathe. Your husband will be coming home from France soon. Yes, he, he's only been over since August, but it seems years. Oh, now he'll be coming home. Very soon, I think. I always knew he would. Lucky man. I went home in a haze of gladness to find the telegram under the door. Mrs. John A. MacDonald, 146 George Street, Baltimore, Maryland. Deeply regret to inform you that Lieutenant John A. MacDonald, 346th Infantry, is officially reported killed in action. November 5th, night. John. He couldn't be dead, no. No, not John. He said he'd come back. He promised. I remember that day. He had come home and locked himself in his room. He had a surprise for me, uh, he don't said. Don't you dare come in, Elizabeth. I have a surprise for you. Now, now, stand back. This is a rather unusual outfit. It needs a certain perspective. All right, here I come, ready or not. Ta-da! John. <laughs> How do you like it? A uniform. Well... Don't take it that way, sweetheart. Oh, you you should have warned me. Oh, you knew I had to get into this war? Yes, but... No, no, don't I... worry. I, <laughs> I've got that army tied hand and foot. I can't make a move without their permission. Oh, darling, I'm going to miss you. Oh, miss me, but, but don't be scared. Promise me you'll come back. Promise not to forget me. Darling. Oh, I'll come back. Count on it. I promise you. I'll come back. 
I promise you. I promise you. John didn't come back. I went back to the chemical plant, comforted by my work and by the knowledge that even though John was dead somewhere in France, his immortality was assured. I was going to have his baby. It was like a secret, a final confidence between us. And I kept the secret until the day I fainted at my desk at the factory. Larry Hamilton had them take me to his own lovely home where his Aunt Jessie could look after me. And there, surrounded by friends and tenderness, I awaited my child. But before the baby, something else arrived. Larry brought home a package and put it in my lap for me to open. Aunt Jessie picked this up at your home today, Elizabeth. Came in the mail. Oh, that's very kind of her. Here, let me cut those strings for you. Hmm? There. Have a good day. Oh, I've had a wonderful day. Your aunt has... Been... Oh. 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 That package, I should have known what it was. Give it to me. No. No, it's all right. I want to see it. Here are some letters I wrote to John, undelivered. I gave him this cigarette case the night before he sailed. You see, we'd had a week together in New York to say goodbye and to plan the future... Now, there's no future to plan. Yes, there is. No, not for John. A man's child is his future. That's what frightens me. If anything should happen, it isn't just another baby being born. It's John. John's life going on. If anything happened to John's child, it would be like John dying all over again. That must never happen. Elizabeth, after the baby is born, surely you won't go back to that lonely house of yours again. It wasn't always lonely. I know it's meant a lot to you. That's why you shouldn't go back there. I've another house in mind for you. For sale or rent? You know what house I mean, Elizabeth. Oh, I I knew you'd say this someday, Larry. You've been so good to me, I, I can't even talk about it. That's why I've got to be honest with you. I'll never love anybody else the way I love John. I understand that. Let me think about it, please. Larry and I were married. My son was born, and we named him Andrew. Drew for short. 1919. And the NC4 spanning the Atlantic Ocean, bringing Europe closer. 1927, the spirit of St. Louis, non-stop New York to Paris, and the continents came closer. A shrinking world, and a little man with a mustache. Today, Germany, tomorrow, the world. Appeasement and the failure of appeasement. Invasion. My son, Drew, was 20 years old. Well, Mother, this certainly looks like it. What do you mean, Drew, this looks like it? The Second World War. This war certainly seems much closer than the last one. It may be closer, Larry, but we're not in it. I don't see how we can keep out of it, Mother. Perhaps Europe wants us to see it that way again, but I don't. Drew, I'll have none of Europe and its quarrels. (laughs) Well, that poses a nice problem for you, Elizabeth. I've asked our new chemist to come to dinner here tomorrow to discuss plans for our new plastics division. The one who came over from England? Yes. Is he frightfully British? Frightfully Austrian and rather frightfully crippled. An accident? From the last war. Was he in the German army? Austrian. Well, they both fought against us. Mother, that was 20 years ago. It seems only yesterday to me, and nothing has changed, only the weapons. I I wish you didn't take that attitude toward the war, Mother. It makes what I've got to say very hard. What is it, Drew? I... I want to join the RAF. The what? The Royal Air Force. You join up in Canada and get your training there. Drew, what do you know about war? You want to be a hero. Do you know what happens to heroes? They die. I remember the last war. I know something about war. You don't. Drew, it's late. I'll talk to you in the morning. All right, Father. Good night, Mother. I won't let him go, Larry. You don't feel the same way I do. He isn't your son. Elizabeth. And we're not at war. If anything happened to Drew, it, it would be John dying all over again. I have to 
after all these years. I'm sorry, darling. I, I just couldn't live through it again. Oh, talk to him, Larry. Please, make him understand. The next evening was the evening of dinner with Mr. Kessler. Promptly at 7.30, the doorbell rang. I came down the stairs just as Mr. Kessler was coming in. He looked up and saw me. He fumbled for his glasses and peered up at me. That broken man, his warped body leaning on a cane. His beard only partially hid the scars of plastic surgery. He looked up at me and I looked down for a moment, strangely suspended in time. And then Larry came into the room and broke the curious spell. Kessler, nice to see you. Elizabeth, this is Mr. Kessler. Oh, how do you do? I'm very glad you could come, Mr. Kessler. A drink before dinner, Kessler? Oh, thank you. Come along. I want you to meet our son before dinner. You, you have a son? Almost 21. Almost 21. He must have been born during the last war. April 1919. Yes. Yes, what, what a tremendous thing it is to, to have a son. You have just heard Act One of Tomorrow is Forever, starring Claudette Colbert and presented by RCA Victor. That name, RCA Victor, pops up everywhere these days in discussions of the greatest achievements of the half century just ended. For RCA Victor set that half century to music. Just as 1900 came in to the music of the magic new Victrola phonograph, so 1950 is coming in to the music of the new RCA Victor magic the 45 RPM system. The 45 magnificently climaxes years of effort by RCA Victor to do three things. To make recorded music sound like live music, to package that music in a small, compact form suited to modern living, and to give it to America at prices we all can pay, as low as $12.95. Hear the 45 soon at your RCA Victor dealer's you'll know right away why it's the people's choice for the recorded music system of the next half century. Now, back to the Screen Director's Playhouse production of Tomorrow is Forever, starring Claudette Colbert with Jeff Chandler. After that first night, Mr. Kessler was a frequent visitor, working with Larry in the study, talking with Drew, whom he seemed to admire profoundly and rather wistfully, I thought. The war went on. There was no further talk of Drew's joining the RAF. And then one evening, we had Mr. Kessler over for dinner again. Drew seemed rather quiet. I wondered if he was well. He looks in the pink to me. Oh, I can vouch for your son's spirits, Mrs. Hamilton. We, we had a most animated conversation before dinner again. You always do. Mr. Kessler and I think a lot alike. Mr. Kessler thinks the Nazis mean to swallow the whole world, a bite at a time. Oh. That's what he and I were talking about tonight, wasn't it, Mr. Kessler? Uh, ideas, ideologies, that, that's all. And did Drew also tell you he wants to join the RAF? Oh, no. Well, I would have said nothing to influence him. Don't blame Mr. Kessler. A man has to make up his own mind, and I've made up mine. Excuse me, Mother. Father. Drew, you're not leaving the table like that. I'm sorry, Mother. Drew! I better talk to him, Elizabeth. Sorry, Kessler. Drew! Oh, I, I'm very sorry, Mrs. Hamilton. I, I will go. No, Mr. Kessler. Wait. I think you should know that I was married before and that my first husband was killed in the last war. Drew is his son. Perhaps that will help you to understand how I feel. It, it's as though something was saying, we'll give you a little rest between blows, but only enough to make sure that you're conscious and able to feel the next one. We won't start another war until your son is just old enough to be killed. If that should happen again. Well, I, 
I wish I could help. You can't. You can only make it worse. Every time I look at you, I think to myself, a man like you killed my husband. That's very true. I know I'm being rude to you. Now I'm going to be ruder still. Mr. Kessler, I'd rather you didn't come here anymore. You bring something into this house that is unwelcome. Forgive me, Mrs. Hamilton. I'll go. The moment he was gone, I was sorry. I'd seen the terrible hurt in his ravaged face. And watching that stricken man tottering out of the house, a great pity overwhelmed me and shame for what I'd done. And something else. Something that for the first time in 21 years made me want to visit the old house, vacant now, where John and I had once lived. December 20th. It was a bleak, unfriendly day. I sat down on the stone steps to be alone with the past, to listen to dim, beloved voices out of yesterday, to dream. Mrs. Hamilton. Yes, John? Mrs. Hamilton, this is Kessler. Hmm? Oh, oh, Mr. Kessler. Are you ill? Let me take you home. No, I'm all right. I used to live in this house. I, I see. This is where I once said goodbye to my husband before he went to war. I didn't have the slightest doubt he'd come home. Not one little doubt. Do you come here often? This is the first time since I left it 21 years ago. Oh, is this some occasion? December 20th, our wedding anniversary. It's a long time to remember. That means nothing to you, December 20th? Why should it? John said he'd come back. He promised. They all said that on both sides, but but some of them couldn't keep that promise. But suppose he didn't die. Suppose that all these years he's been alive, not wanting to come back to me because of something that happens, some terrible, heartbreaking wound that made him ashamed to show himself to me. That would have been so wrong of him, you know. So cruel. Why do you torture yourself so? You you have a husband now who is devoted to you. You have a fine son. You have a good life. You should keep it so. Why are you here? This house is far out of your way. And I I, I was was passing by from the public library, these these books. Why didn't you use the library at the plant? These books are German. But the plant's German collection is better than the public libraries, and you know it. You're lying to me. You are John MacDonald. I am Eric Kessler, an Austrian chemist. All my life I have worked at my profession, except for a few years when I I was a good soldier. I've told you who I am. Goodbye, Mrs. Hamilton. Hamilton Laboratory, Kessler speaking. Mr. Kessler, is my husband in the laboratory with you? Well, Mr. Hamilton is in a meeting with some British purchasing agents. It'll last all night, I'm afraid. Drew has disappeared. Drew? Vanished. I think he may be off to Canada to enlist. Well, I- I'll do what I can. Oh, please. Goodbye, Mrs. Hamilton. Cold, unseasonable downpour, drenched and shivering, Mr. Kessler brought home my son. Drew went to his room to sulk and to change his sodden clothes. I gave Mr. Kessler brandy and made him warm himself before the fire. I had a small rosewood box in my lap. I waited for Mr. Kessler to speak first. (coughs) It's a very bad night, Mrs. Hamilton. How did you know Drew was at the railroad station? Well, I I opened the note he left on Mr. Hamilton's desk. It wasn't addressed to you. To father. (coughs) 
So you opened it and you read it. Mr. Kessler, I have some things in this box I want you to look at. Begin with this cigarette case. Take it. Read the inscription. <coughs> to John from Elizabeth. With all my love. Do you remember? Why should I? Open the case. That picture inside is me, as I was 21 years ago. It's very beautiful. That's what you said when you gave it to me. Oh, John, why didn't you come back? You promised you would. Was it because you'd been so terribly hurt? Because you were afraid I'd turn from you? Didn't you know how I needed you, needed to help you, no matter what happened to you, as long as you were alive? John, don't you remember how I loved you? Don't you remember the nights we sat before the fire like this in our own house? I had my head in your lap like this. Oh, don't. Remember? You used to take my face like this. And put it up to yours. Look at me, John, and tell me you don't want me back. Say it. Do you think any man in his senses would... <coughs> would want to give back this shattered body to a woman and, and destroy the memory of 20 years? John. If I were your husband, if I had come back, that is what I would say. Your life was once all but destroyed by a war. You are terrified it will be destroyed again, so you look for refuge in the past. And the past, with its good and its bad, is beyond our reach. It, it's gone, all gone. We must forget it. You and I? The world. We must live for tomorrow. Because tomorrow is forever. And you have your husband, your son, your life... Larry Hamilton is your husband, no other man. What shall I do about Drew? I brought him home, so you could tell him he might follow his conscience as he wishes. Thank you. <coughs> Goodbye, Mrs. Hamilton. In the morning, I thought Mr. Kessler could see Drew off at the airport. I went to his apartment. Our family friend, Dr. Callan, answered the door. Oh, Mrs. Hamilton, good morning. Dr. Callan, what are you doing here? I... don't you know? Weren't you notified? Mr. Kessler? Yes. Pneumonia. His heart. He died this morning. I pushed past him and into the bare, chilly room. I stopped. There he was on the couch. Stillness. Dignity. Peace at last. I sank slowly to my knees and touched that poor, wounded face. I folded his hands. Yes, he looked at peace, happier than he had been, oh, for 20 years or more. And I bent and kissed the pale, cold brow of, of this good man I had known, this lonely man, Mr. Kessler. <laughs> You have just heard Tomorrow is Forever. Our star, Claudette Colbert, and our special guest, screen director Irving Pitchell, will be with us in just a moment. Next Friday, another great star brings one of his most memorable performances to the screen director's playhouse. Our story is Mr. Lucky, and recreating his original role will be Cary Grant with screen director H.C. Potter. Now, here again is tonight's star, Claudette Colbert.
Claudette, do you remember during those sad war days how we used to distract ourselves sometimes by dreaming about the wonders of the post-war world? I certainly do, Jimmy. We were all going to have helicopters, and every single old-fashioned object in our homes was going to be streamlined. Whatever happened to all those dreams? Well, RCA Victor has made quite a few of them come true, like their 45 RPM system of recorded music. Say, you know, the 45 does come pretty near to dream specifications. Oh, you found that out too, Claudette. Mm Mm-hmm. I have a portable 45, and it's the first portable I've ever been able to port. (laughs) Yes, the 45 is by far the smallest, lightest automatic record changer ever made. And the 45 records are so light that even with 14 of them loaded in the top of your portable, you can hardly notice the difference in weight. I don't notice it at all, Jimmy. My 45 is so light, I often tuck it under my arm and carry it easily to the studio. Yes, Claudette, the smallness of the 45 makes a lot of difference to a lot of people. Even if you live in a trailer, you can have a whole library of the tiny 45 records. What's more, the 45 costs so little, a farmer's wife could buy one out of her egg money. You see, prices start at only twelve ninety-five, mm, And she'd hear music almost as fine as she could hear at the Met. Oh, you're right, Claudette. With the 45, she'd think the singers were right in the room. And what's more, she could really listen. No worry about evening gowns and family jewels. The 45 is sweeping the country. And it's easy as pie for everyone to get acquainted with it. Meet the 45 anytime at your RCA Victor dealers. Ladies and gentlemen, the difference between an actor and a director is, well, it's just about 10 feet. The distance from one side of the camera to the other... And believe me, traveling that ten feet is just about the most difficult journey an actor can make. Now, I'd like you to meet a man who made the trip, the director of such fine motion pictures as Without Honor and The Moon is Down, and my director in Tomorrow is Forever, Irving Pitchell. Thank you, Claudette. But you know, sometimes I regret ever having been an actor. Why, Irving, you're a traitor. Claudette, you've no idea what goes on inside an actor's mind when he tries to be a director. As an actor, I say to myself, Irving, if you were doing that part, you'd do it like this. (laughs) What does Pitchell, the director, say? Irving, don't be a ham. Who's directing this, you or me? (laughs) What happens then? An argument. I'm not a ham. You are. I'm not. You're fired. I quit. (laughs) And how does it all end? (laughs) Claudette, how does anything end in Hollywood? We go to lunch, I talk it over with myself, go back to the set and shoot the picture. (laughs) Having the trouble with Pitchell the actor is that he just doesn't appreciate Pitchell the director. But the rest of us actors and actresses do. We'll never argue with you, Irving. All we want to do is work for you. Thank you, Claudette, and good night. Good night, Irving, and good night, everyone. Good night to you, Claudette Colbert and Irving Pitchell. Remember next Friday, Cary Grant and screen director H.C. Potter brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. Tomorrow is Forever was presented by arrangement with Universal International Studios, now releasing South Sea Sinners, starring Shelley Winters, McDonald Carey, and Helena Carter. Claudette Colbert is currently starring in the RKO production Bride for Sale. Irving Pitchell's latest film is the George Powell production, The Great Rupert, starring Jimmy Durante. Jeff Chandler appeared by arrangement with Universal International Pictures, now releasing Woman in Hiding, starring Ida Lupino, Howard Duff, and Stephen McNally. Included in tonight's cast were Sam Edwards, John McIntyre, Henry Rowland, Bill Lally, and Frank Barton. Tomorrow is Forever was adapted for radio by Milton Geiger, and original music was composed and conducted by William Lava. Screen Director's Playhouse is produced by Howard Wiley with dramatic direction by Bill Karn. This is Jimmy Wallington speaking and inviting you to listen again next Friday when RCA Victor presents... Screen Director's Playhouse, star Cary Grant, production Mr. Lucky, director H.C. Potter... Next, hear We the People over most of these same NBC stations.